Cheers. Man. Hey, Lars. Morning. How are you? Good. How are you? you? Made it just in time. Good morning. Thank you for all coming today. Got a real special talker today, and his name's up there, so you'll hear him in a few minutes. Got a few announcements to say before uh, we talk about. We'll let him get up here and take stage. His son has helped him uh, create some of these uh, great slides. But uh, what he's got to say is more. We turn the lights off up front. Uh, figure out, dim the lights up the front so we can see the slides. Um, a few announcements. Uh, number one, you probably saw the mayor announce recently that Evansville was named a uh, World War II Heritage City. There's only 19 cities in the United States that have had that, that designation. So, one, one of our board members put the paperwork in for that two years ago and it was just accepted recently, but that was national news. And if you look at the 19 other cities that were that, that was announced, uh, far, I think we probably in the top five of those. And all the homework that's been done for this museum was very beneficial for us getting that designation. Uh, so uh, kudos to all these volunteers, board members that uh, give a lot of their service here. We've got up to 8,000 service hours this year, which is a lot of hours of volunteers. We're run mostly by volunteers, two paid employees, but uh, mostly volunteers. So. If you want to wear a red shirt, um, then you can come here and help. Bruce Green is in charge of our volunteers, and we got Bruce, you come up here to stage so they see who you are. If you'd like to help out, uh, you can do anything. You can do maintenance, you can be a docent, you can help in archives. Our archives, we've got about five people working on it, but we really need 15 people working on it. This is Bruce, and He's from Rockport, he comes all the way over here, helps out a ton, he's in charge of the volunteers, so you go talk to him directly and he'll let you do uh, in one of the different sections here. But our archives needs a lot of work. We have close to 9,000 items. We have about 7,000 uh, scanned, photographed, and indexed, and it's gonna be up on Pass Perfect on the internet, hopefully in January of this year, but we need help because uh, a lot of stuff comes in frequently. Um, our next talks, uh, January 5th, I think that's a Thursday, uh, Claude Wirtz is going to talk. He had Wirtz Lumber Company, his family's going to talk a little bit about World War II. And I was supposed to have another guy talk from Indianapolis. He lives in Indianapolis now, but he's very knowledgeable on Evansville, Evansville history, and he's going to give, um, give us a review of that. Another gentleman up there that's, uh, his name's, uh, uh, Dick Albright will probably talk on Zoom with us at that time. And then later in the month in January, a guy's come on from Hancock, Kentucky, and he's an expert in planes, and he's going to talk about ultralights. Ultralights are things that are less than 250 pounds that fly. It's a real popular thing. He's had 4,000 hours in there. That's like more hours than you'd ever believe. And he's going to talk and also about an a ancient plane, in a 1928 Corbin, he hopefully he flies and you can look at it here. Uh, and then we've got a whole set of lectures all the way scheduled through July. One guy's gonna talk in July, his name, he comes here frequently, his name's Tom Carr. His dad ran the Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company here in Evansville. Uh, and I think some of you would know what that is. It was the biggest employer in the United States in the 1950s, AMP Grocery. But he was a submariner, and he uh, talked just recently about December 7th. Remember, that was a big day. We went to war, and this is what we're gonna talk about a little bit today over the war that was really the biggest thing in the 20th century and probably uh, in our future. So today's talk, it's gonna be uh, James Whalen. His name's up there. My dad was on LST for four years of World War II, so I heard this lecture probably a hundred times, maybe a thousand times but we made more LSTs than anywhere else in the world. We made 167 here, and everybody was at the same time at the same starting gate, and we made more showing your efficiency of productivity here in Evansville. Um, the uh, LST he was on, we're gonna talk a little bit about over in the Philippines. 
Philippines, the United States took the Philippines, and we were in a war there from, I think, 1898 to 1902, and Teddy Roosevelt was part of it, and it, uh, we annexed it back over to them in 1946. But it's hard to, it was one of the things that the United States went to a foreign place to act a little bit like England and take over property, but it's hard to keep that property and hard to keep people liking you over there. So there's lots of difficulties with owning uh, or trying to own Philippine Island. But it's very strategically placed. If MacArthur and Nimitz got in a lot of arguments over what they should do at that time in 1944. Nimitz said we should take over Formosa, which is Taiwan. It would be more strategically uh, beneficial to the United States. But MacArthur said in 42, I will return. And so MacArthur says we need to get the Philippines. Both of them were strategically important. But uh, we were very lucky today to hear some person that was in that area in 1944. You won't get this very often. And on one of the LSTs that uh, uh, one of the 1100 were made, World War II were made here. So Jim Whalen, come on up. showed up in force this morning. Appreciate your support. Also, uh, uh, thanks to the my friends from the village at Holiday Healthcare. That's where I live. And uh, a special thanks to the staff there who provided transportation for them. I'll, uh, I'll just start this with, uh, I joined the Navy in 19... 1943, yeah, okay. Uh, can you hear me now? <laughs> uh, I, I went to uh, Great Lakes Naval Te Training Center in at Great Lakes, Illinois. And after boot camp, I went to hospital course school. Well, that wasn't one of my first choices. But I thought, okay, I'll, I'll just flunk out of hospital course school. <laughs> and then I'll, uh, I'll pick another one that's closer to my first choice. Well, the first day at uh, course school, our orientation meeting, uh, Chief Petty Officer was speaking, and uh, during his speech he said, uh, I've heard that some of you plan on plunking out of hospital course school and you'll be able to go on to what you want. Well, let me put your mind at ease. The only way you get out of hospital course school is your hands folded across your chest and a lily. <laughs> As it, as it turned out, I enjoyed course school <laughs> and decided that I would that I would try not to flunk out. But we we learned a lot of new things, uh, completely new to me. And I thought, okay, this is uh, this will be beneficial in my career in the Navy and also in in uh, in life after that. We uh, learned quite a bit, quite a bit, and uh, actually it wasn't long until I put some of it to use. I was downtown in Chicago one weekend, and I witnessed an accident. 
a, a man was crossing the street and a car hit him. Well, he's laying there, he's laying there in the street and there's blood, there's blood pretty much all over the place. Well, my training kicked in. I knew exactly what to do. I put my head down between my knees so I wouldn't faint. <laughs> so I finished, I finished hospital court school and then went to uh, San Diego, the Naval Hospital there. Received uh, additional training, on-job training, and there was also uh, some formal training. But after six months of that, I decided that I would sign up for sea duty. Well, I took a uh, I took a troop ship to Hawaii, and there I caught my first LST. It was a Coast Guard ship, LST 20. But there was there was 11 hospital foremen on that ship. As it turned out, we were designated as an evacuation ship for the wounded going into the Philippines. So we made our way to. Uh, Okay, uh, we made our way to uh, Lady Gulf. We, uh, we went in at D minus three, at, so we got there three days before MacArthur did. But uh, this was the largest naval operation during World War II, and some say the largest naval operation ever. There was over 200,000 naval personnel involved in the Battle of Leahy. The second day we were there, we heard of some commotion. We went up to the main deck and looked around and there's a plane coming in over the, over the harbor and every ship in that harbor was shooting at it. Well, naturally, we figured this is an enemy plane. There's no way he could make it through that. But as it turned out, it was not an enemy plane, but one of our own. This plane went probably 25 or 30 yards from us and pretty low to the water. We could actually see the pilot in there working with controls. And the, uh, I guess it was the harbor master. Harbor master came on and said, you SOB, you have just shot down one of your own men. He only, he didn't say SOP. <laughs> he spelled it out pretty graphically. We did learn later that, uh, that the, uh, the pilot was able to bring this in without hitting any of the friendly ship, and he also survived. So uh, the third day, this was the day of the invasion. We started out our day at, with breakfast in the dining room, and we're just kind of killing time to see what was going to happen. All of a sudden we heard a loud noise and our ship jumped. Somebody said, grab your life jacket, guys, we've been hit. So we did, we grabbed our life jackets and went topside, looked around, didn't see any damage to our ship, didn't see any damage to anyone near us. So uh, I guess 15 or 20 minutes later, we learned what it was. The USS California was anchored out into the bay further, and it was firing a salvo over, softening up the beach, and it went right over us. Pretty soon there was other ships doing the same thing, so we discovered what it was that shook us up initially. Well, we had kind of a ringside seat to the invasion, but after planes coming over and bombing and the uh, and the ships in the harbor doing their shelling. And then the first wave of the personnel went in. They went in a small craft. They, uh, they took a spot on the beach and was able to then for the LSTs to go in and empty their cargo and personnel. So we had kind of had a ringside seat to the beginning of the war in Lady. We, uh, excuse me. We 
really didn't have anything to do because uh, the casualties in, uh, in the Philippine operation was much lower than what they anticipated, so they didn't need us as an evacuation ship. So we were just kind of sitting in a holding pattern waiting to see what would be, what we'd be called on to do next. Several days later, just after dark, an ammunition dump that was near us blew up. And they told us later, while we were supposed to be in total blackout, there was someone smoking a cigarette and a single Japanese plane was in the area and saw that light dropped a bomb and the ammo hit the ammo dump. Well, I guess they saw, here's 11 corpsmen sitting out there doing nothing. We'll get them in here and help with that. This is what they did. They came, told us, you guys gather up all your gear because you won't be coming back to this ship. So we went ashore and they had a temporary hospital set up there. So we just kind of followed the doctors around doing what they told us to do, uh, putting on bandage, and then we stayed with that for a couple of days, changing bandages and checked to see if there was uh, infection and that sort of thing. Well, after that, I was assigned then to LST-205, which was a Navy ship. And then we we're kind of in a holding pattern, waiting for what was coming next. This is when we, when we got our, uh, we got, we got our order to go to Mindoro. The, uh, it's, uh, it's a little hard to see, but as we, uh, as we started out in the convoy, there was nine LSTs. And we were, we were the first ship in the third row. We lined up three, three in a row for three rows. And we hadn't, we hadn't gone too, too long till we were called to general quarters and went to LSTO. It's a little hard to see, but uh, when called to general quarters, my station was main deck forward, which is just behind those uh, gun tubs that you see there on the bow of the ship. If we had not been at General Quarters too long till the kamikaze came in and hit that first ship in the first row. It was, it was, a, it was pretty tough on that ship because they lost power. They went dead in the water. There was fire on the ship. So the convoy pulled out and pulled away from them. One of the uh, destroyers. Incidentally, there were seven first-line destroyers as escort for us on this convoy. They, anyway, they stayed behind with that ship to uh, give it some protection. It wasn't much longer till a second kamikaze came and it hit the first ship in the middle row. They were a little luckier because they did not lose power. They were able to hold their formation in the convoy and travel with the rest of us. Pretty soon then, this third uh, kamikaze showed up and they're headed toward us. It, uh, it, it came in a little bit too low and uh, didn't hit the, uh, hit the bridge or any part of the ship. So uh, we, we were, I guess it's hard to say that you're lucky that you got hit by a kamikaze, but we were lucky in that respect that it didn't do much damage to our ship. Pretty soon, uh, four or five uh, P-47s showed up. Now, P-47, like the plane that you see right back here, and also the ones that were manufactured here in Evansville. One of those, uh, we had a P-38 pilot on the ship that was one of our passengers, and he said, I never thought I'd be so damn glad to see a judge. 
the jug was the uh, nickname that they gave that P-47. So uh, now uh, all of us who were above deck saw what was going on, or at least uh, had an idea of what was going on. But the, uh, the crew below deck, they didn't, uh, they didn't know what was going on. They knew that something happened, but they didn't have a, uh, you know, much knowledge about what was going on. The, uh, turned out they shifted the, the plane that hit us, came in too low, and he missed his target. Maybe he had too much sake before he left, but he missed, he missed his target, and, uh, and the whole plane, basically, the engine and all, ran into the bow of the ship and went off into the water. Well, part of the plane came on the deck, but that was basically it. So uh, all those guys below are wondering now what's going on. There wasn't, uh, wasn't any official announcement or anything like that to tell those people what was happening, but there was, there was rumor. You know, rumors travel just slightly less than the speed of light. And they also, they also get a little bit, uh, they get muddled occasionally because they, uh, they, they pass from one person to the other. The, uh, the actual word that reached these guys in the engine room was the ship in the fan. <laughs> so, so we proceeded on to uh, Mindoro then. Uh, as we were on our way, uh, we learned that there was one casualty during this. The uh, officer was uh, stationed on the boat deck and when he saw the plane coming in, he thought, okay, this guy's gonna hit me. So he jumped down to the main deck and broke his ankle. But fortunately, the doctor was there. They fixed him up with the, with the uh, cast and he's okay. A couple of us uh, scrounged a couple of pieces of this uh, of the wing, aluminum wing, and we took it down into the engine room or in the, in the uh, shop and made bracelets. Got a couple little bracelets with the engraved the date and time and so forth on there. It wasn't it wasn't a pretty thing, not like what you would find at Breaker Jewel or anything like that. But uh, it was a memento of the of the kamikaze hitting our ship. Well we went and made excuse me <coughs> We went on into Mindoro, unloaded our uh, cargo and our passengers, and went back down to Lady. We didn't have anything exciting to do for the next few months. We just made small trips from one island to the next, moving, uh, moving uh, personnel and equipment and that sort of thing. It looked like we were kind of the FedEx during the, of the uh, the LST moved this merchandise around during the war. We, uh, we traveled throughout the Pacific. We got as far south as Australia and New Zealand, uh, picking up supplies for ourselves and also delivering other supplies to, uh, from one island to the other. And we headed back to San Francisco. It just so happened that on VJ Day, we were in San Francisco. Now, if you ever saw a picture of San Francisco, of Market Street, I'm sure you could pick me out because I was one of the 5,000 people there on Market Street. <laughs> but this uh, Market Street on VJ was a sight to behold. Yeah, I, I, I can't explain it to you, it just had to be there. There was hugging and kissing and here, have a drink out of my bottle. I know how to have a drink out of your bottle. And you, when everybody was so happy, they couldn't believe it. So we, uh, after that, we moved on, made short trips from one island to the other, and then it was decided that we would decommission our ship. 
So we made it, made a trip down through the Panama Canal around to Galveston, Texas, and uh, decommissioned the ship there. It took a little, roughly three or four weeks. So then it was my time to get discharged. I, they sent me back. I ended up back at Great Lakes where I started. Got my discharge papers and I headed home and I said, okay, I'm through with the Navy now. But about four years later, I got that dreaded disease gone to Korea. <laughs> so, but that's, but that's another story for another time. Thank you so much. Any, any questions? Most of it, we got our we got our 
we got refueled at a land station. Did you ever run everybody sick on your ship? Because sometimes you put a ship next to yours and you put them on a rope in a little gurney and slide them over. Did you ever have to do that? I saw that, but we did not do it. Yeah, it's a lot of fun being on that slide. Um, <laughs> now, um, but there was a Mr. Buto and he talked here. He was on LST in the Philippine War. We put him on YouTube as well. There's somebody got a question over here. I don't see any questions. I can't believe no questions of him today. Um, you know, uh, Mike Dean back there, we got one over here. Mike Dean in the back, Larry. Where'd Larry go with the microphone? Okay, I guess I'll walk out with it. Somebody's supposed to be working here. <laughs> stay there, stay there, stay there. Okay. So, so, so Jim? Say your name. Uh, my name's Ron Keller, and uh, I know at one point there was a huge hurricane, a typhoon that came into Leyte and they had to pull pull away. Did you get every did you, did you hear that? No, I didn't. He talked about a hurricane or a typhoon they called typhoons over that hit Leyte Gulf at some time. Did you remember that when that occurred? Uh, I was not there then. I did experience a typhoon at Guam though. And uh, it, we were we were anchored. It broke away from the anchor. We ran into an aircraft carrier, but uh, I, I did not experience these in the Philippines. Did it hurt your ship when you ran into the aircraft carrier? It hurt the air aircraft carrier. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we got a couple back there, Larry. Right, uh, other questions back there. Michael Dean, he'll walk up here. You got to talk in the microphone, Mike. You can't yell. It. I know you want to yell. Michael Dean is a Vietnam veteran, and uh, uh, he, uh, his father-in-law is Mr. Brinker, who Lloyd Brinker died about uh, three years ago, and he's got a case in there about flying the hump, and Mike Dean's helped out here a lot. Okay, Mike. Yes, sir, I've noticed that you had nine ships in, a, in, your, in your tubs. You've got 40s and 20s. Did you guys have radar to pick up the kamikazes because if, if they would have picked it up early enough, they would have been able to at least shoot back at them. Well, I, I'm not positive about that. I know we had radar, but I don't know if they picked up these kamikazes. You would think they probably would have alerted and we would have had protection earlier. So for some reason or other, it didn't get, they didn't get stopped. Those first three came in with unimpeded. Thank you. And how much gas? How much gas and how much fuel did the uh, LST hold? And how long did it take to, to fill it? Uh, you've got me there. You know, <laughs> you know they, uh, that's, uh, I think that is a uh, need to know basis. And <laughs> <laughs> they, evidently, I didn't need to know very much because the parents had never been told me anything. <laughs> it took a lot of gas money. Say your name, please. My name is Carolyn Stilwell, and please, how common was it for a kamikaze to hit an LST? Well, uh, obviously that's the only uh, time I experienced it at all, but I, I would guess that the LST moved very slowly, you know, the average speed was seven or eight knots, and uh, there would be a there would be a target, but I, I really couldn't answer your question. Uh, they there was a lot of kamikaze late in the war when they got desperate. But not only they and again they wouldn't they wouldn't probably wouldn't dive at an LST. They would go for the larger ships. And to answer that a little bit, I've had to do go to Google Earth to read about these things. But it said there was a lot of kamikaze that were used at this Philippine war, and they lost, I think, 600 kamikazes. That's when they used them the most, and it's what uh, Jim said, at the end of the war, they were used in desperation, uh, but a lot were used then. My dad was in the Battle of Okinawa, which was a little later than him, and they got stuck on a coral reef for one 24-hour period, and he said kamikazes went right over us and could have gotten us, but they went for the bigger ships. They didn't care about the LSTs, 
they didn't think they were significant enough, so they'd like to go after bigger ones. But in this event, they went after the three lead ships in, in his uh, hotel. Uh, other question? Okay, back in the back, Stephanie. Uh, any, somebody over here? We got one over here. Got to identify yourself. There's a gentleman in a red hat. He's got an IU hat. At least he's got the right hat on. Uh, they lost three games in a row. When are they going to start winning again? We thought they were the best. You should you and have they beat University of North Carolina. Thought they were going to be the number one. Okay, we'll talk to about the ships now. Go ahead, identify yourself. Uh, my name's James Woods, and I was wondering what. Uh, since you were basically the medical officer, what uh, what did you actually, what was the major problem you had to deal with on the ship? Uh, basically, uh, it was a uh, headache, stomach aches, and uh, oh, maybe they would cut themselves or that kind of thing. It was uh, small bandages, and like I said, two ABCs and a light duty slip was mostly what I had to spend. It, fortunately, my my crew was very healthy, and we didn't have any major problems. And in the Navy, I was in the Navy 24 years, the doctors didn't like to be on the ships, partly because it was sort of boring. Like Jim said, there wasn't a lot of action, but some of these bigger ships are like factories, and I ended up with a lot of eye injuries. All of this stuff was flying in guys' eyes, and, and a lot of injuries did occur on some of the bigger ships, but uh, uh, usually not a lot of action on the ships for doctors. Hi, I'm Nate. Marianne Winslow, and I'm sorry to be stupid, but what's an ABC? Uh, aspirin, aspirin, phenacetin, and codeine. Okay. Uh, codeine was the main product, and that's the reason everybody wanted one of that. <laughs> <laughs> we got. Okay, one more question. Where's Stephanie? This is a. Uh, Safety pictures her and her husband helped volunteer. That's why they got red on. And they have that command car over there. If you look at it on the other side of the LST, there's only 154 major Chrysler here in every, and they got by Chrysler, there's only one left in the world that's theirs. It's in good shape. Okay, Stephanie. So I need to know if you are a polywog or a shellback. Oh, okay. Okay, when you pass the, over the uh, international date line, there is an initiation. Once you've completed that initiation, you're a polywog. Yeah. And before, what are you called? Uh, I'm a blank. I'm a, what do you call before, Stephanie? I thought once you cross the, the equator, you were a shellback. Yeah. 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 And, and the polywog was before. Yeah, okay. <laughs> what did they do to you? Uh, you can say. Well, uh, the initiation was pretty tough, I'll tell you that. Uh, I remember that when I was, went through the initiation, uh, they had a dead fish. It had been put out on the deck for well over a week and just smelled awful. And you had to get down on your knees and kiss that fish. So I said, okay, I'm just going to get really close to it, and I'm not, but I'm not going to kiss it. But just as I got down there near it, a guy hit me with a cattle prod, and my nose went right into the <laughs> when, when I was a part of then when we crossed the date line, I was one of the givers. I was the royal dentist, and so I made up a concoction of adrenaline and uh, castor oil. <laughs> so I had, I had a grease gun with that little no nozzle on there and I reached back and put it way back in the corner of the mouth and squirt that. And the guy told me later, said, it took me a week to get rid of that nasty taste in my mouth. <laughs> yeah. Didn't like that initiation, we got one order. Initiation, now, we've got, uh, General in the back, maybe uh, he had initiation there. Uh, Eddie, Eddie's dad. Do you have initiation? You're in the Navy 24 years. How many years you in the Navy? Yeah. Eddie's dad. You, yeah. Jim. How many years you in the Navy? 24. Well, tell us how you got initiated. 
He's a wall. Okay, he didn't get this yet. All right. My name's Paul Michael. Besides landing ship tank, I know there was another name that you guys called the LST. Do you remember it? No. No, I don't remember it at all. Well, I worked on the LST here at Evansville. They also called it the Long Slow Target. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. Large slope target or large large slope target because actually it was only eight miles an hour. You could get up to 13 miles an hour, but it was slow. And when you landed on the beach, you were there 24 hours till the high tide came back to get you. So you were you're a sitting target when they unloaded you if you unloaded on the beach. I, I heard another thing for that was some of the crewmen on other ships said last ship there because it was so slow. Okay. <laughs> Can, can you tell us that this that ship has the most ships have a large anchor on the front, almost all ships. This the LST has its biggest anchor on the back, and it's when you land and you have to hold the ship straight so the the, the waves don't push you aside. Did you ever have to put the anchor out the back the back anchor? And what was that experience like? Well, every every time we went on the beach, we dropped the anchor. We dropped the anchor out about 200 yards. So they used that to help pull us off of the beach after we unloaded our cargo. So it, uh, we used the anchor every time we beached. And was the beaching rough? Would you uh, land on, not coral reef, land on sand beach in the Philippines, or where else did you land? Because that's a very unique concept. It really won the war, World War II. Uh, this, this thing that's like a big whale, it drops on the beach and the old front opens and they let out 15 Sherman tanks, but, or he let out other things, but, can you tell us about that experience? Well, uh, when, you, when you went into the beach, you generally speaking, you were loaded and sitting low in the, into the water. Well, once you got on the beach, we, and we again, we dropped the anchor out, and after you unloaded your cargo, and s sometimes they would dump some of the bills water, and that would raise your ship up anywhere from eight to 10 inches, and generally speaking, with the pull on the anchor and the reverse of the engines, you could get off of the beach. Our, our LST-325 was going through Barkley Lake and got stuck in Barkley Lake about five years ago, and it was stuck for about a week, and uh, they used that back an the anchor on the, on the uh, back of the ship to pull them off, but I think they just raised the level of the lake that probably helped more than anything else. But they were stuck a whole week and the captain was in trouble because of that. Other questions here? Oh, yeah, I've got one back out there. Come find him, Larry. Just never come up here. She wants to know what number your LST was. My number, 205. And most ships have other names, but the LSTs, they gave them a number, and there's a reason why they gave them numbers. I think they had a, there was a military reason, but I don't remember what that is. But that's unique just having only a number where the aircraft carriers, I think, were CB-44 or other things. He's going to tell yeah, you. Um, I've volunteered at the LST for a couple of years, and they told us the reason they did not give them a name was they would just said considered them a disposable ship. They didn't think they would even make it through the war. So they just said, why name them? So just give them the number. And a lot of LSTs in the 1950s, they were torn apart and made part of our interstate highway that Eisenhower approved. So a lot of them are in your interstate highways. But uh, our LST here in Evansville, there was, uh, there was, only, there was 7,000 ships in D-Day, and it's the only one left that's floating out of 7,000 ships. So it's pretty amazing to have that here in Evansville, uh, in the end. I think when they got them to the Korea, they gave them names, but when they used them in Korea, they gave them names. Okay, Norman says they gave them names in Korea. So that was a, a, later, a later war, uh, but gave names. We've got IU go again, you get the microphone. Go ahead. But let me get the microphone to you. All right, you, uh, uh, whatever your general quarters, you were at your station was up front. Did you have a special, did you have a special uh, station whenever they were landing, uh, or did you have a... <coughs> the question, did he have, 
in general quarters when you're in an emergency situation, everybody's got a place. And he said when you're landing, uh, did you have a special place? No, uh, generally speaking, uh, we learned at general quarters that the only time we had special place was during general quarters. And uh, as a rule, we were not at general quarters when we were landed. Usually, they would clear away the beach before we ever got there. So we were, we were not at general quarters when we landed. And how many people ran your ship? Was there like 10 officers and 90 crew? That would be called ship's company. Is that about what? Ship's company. We had 135 uh, total uh, crew. And how many people could you transport? Was it another two or 300 sometimes? Uh, generally speaking, we moved equipment. We did not move uh, and just the enough personnel to manage that equipment. We did not take on personnel as a general rule. That front uh, opening, uh, there's a front opening uh, door to the LST, and that was created about 1940. It used to open a different way when they used that type of ship for oil down in Venezuela. Did you tell us about the mechanism opening up and dropping and how, how easy was that to manage? Well, it looked easy enough because the, the main bow doors would just open up wide and there was a ramp that sat right behind that. That would flop down and that would hit onto the beach and it looked like it was pretty easy. Because we've asked them to do that the LST here and they really have refused because they say it just hasn't been worked on for many years and would be in jeopardy to do that with our LST here, but it would be the real, real McCoy if we would. Right. But you did it a lot of times. Oh yes, yes, no, no problem with it. After after that plane hit us, there was a there was a couple of dents in the bow doors, but it didn't affect the mechanism of the lower of the ramp. So what? Uh, remember what Churchill said after Dirk Dunkirk? He said, "If you can't get men and machines to land." You're never going to win this war. That was in '39. We had Mr. Willis talk about that a little while ago. But uh, men and machines, and the LST was a big factor in getting men and machines to land in Europe and also on the West. Okay, uh, well, we want all of you to have a Merry Christmas. We've got a new technology here, um, and I want to. I'm going to tell you about new technology. If you bring one of those things, those scanner cards from the front somebody there's a scan it's on the front it's on the front scan door just bring one i'm going to show them. uh i can't thank you enough james and we have his whole family here uh right up here and for his uh son create these good slides and all this firsthand story you're not going to hear anything like this again we'll put this on youtube it'll be up in about a week okay I wanted to tell you about a, a scanning ability that we have here now. It's called a QR code, a QR code also called beacons. So if you get bored,